So today we're going to be talking about one of the most exciting parts of church planting, which is church planting movements. We're going to be looking at 12 key factors associated with really amazing church growth cross-culturally and across the globe. Part of this is the rapid exponential growth of indigenous churches. So this book is by David Garrison. The first principle is the authority of scripture. The Bible isn't just a bestseller or a work of history, but it's one of these unfolding themes of God's redemption of mankind through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's the word of God and has the power to change our lives today. And that's what all church planting movements believe. That's a key factor that the Holy Bible is the word of God. So the first one is the authority of scripture. Secondly, passionate, fervent prayer. You are not enough. You can't do it on your own. You don't have good enough programs or whatever to make a church planting movement. Uh, You really need the Spirit's empowerment, God's empowerment on you, and a strong sense of God's direct involvement. So two is passionate, fervent prayer. And then intentional church planting. You need a real call, a real sense of purpose when you plant a church, not turning to the right or to the left. A leader needs to have a determined goal and that the very call of God on on their lives is paired with a heart of compassion for the lives of their friends and their city in order to plant a church. The Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. They need you. They need the word of God in their lives and a chance to hear the good news that we have a good heavenly father who loves us and who saves us. That's the third one to have intentionality in church planting. The fourth one is that local leadership is key. In the olden days, missionaries would often go through enormous cultural and linguistic barriers that separated them from the local people. So we need church leaders that are thoroughly equipped with the word of God and, and can pass through those cultural and linguistic barriers with no problems. People in the village need to see a model of what God can do in a life. They need local leadership to be examples of Christ in their families, in their churches, in their businesses. And local leadership understands how to be an effective witness to the community. So local leadership. The next one is bivocational or lay leadership. So just like Paul, the fastest growing churches raise up trained, unpaid, but unprofessional leaders. These leaders share the gospel and are involved in discipleship, planting new churches, and help the area hear the gospel. Lay leaders can participate in inductive Bible studies, and even though they may not have the opportunity to train in seminary, they can learn on the job, they can learn by doing, and they can be entrusted to be involved in the leadership of the local church. So number five is bivocational lay leadership. Then there's local training of church leadership. You need to have a vision for raising up local leaders, like John the Baptist, making a way to disciple and train up those to follow the Lord so that they'll go further than you. Don't expect them to give up everything, move to a different city to study the Bible. You need to train them there locally in order for rapid church growth and expansion to take place. Like Timothy, God wants you to become a trainer that trains others. The 222 principle, or the 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, is about modeling and mentoring, has, has proved invaluable for training leaders in church planting movements. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 2 it says, And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. So Paul teaching Timothy, Timothy teaching reliable people, and those people teaching other people to be trainers. So part of this is the mall approach, the model, assist, watch, and leave. You don't just want to be like to a little baby, hey, there's food in the fridge, there's a bathroom downstairs. An infant will die if it's just left in the center of the floor. So the same thing with local leadership. You can't just say, here's a Bible, church services on Sunday. They're not going to survive if that's your training. Healthy churches. So whether it's a big group or a small group, can tell a healthy church by its fruit. Just like Jesus said, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. So in a healthy church, you want to see a couple good fruits in that church. And part of that is that uh, you have teaching and obedience to the word. So that's that's really your, one of your first steps. Secondly is, is worship. So worshiping in spirit and in truth. And then a real sincere love, that there's love in your church. Also that there's fervent prayer uh, that has faith. Baptism is a really important command of Christ as well, as well as serving the community and and, um, tithing and giving. Another really important thing is communion. 
So taking communion together, to experience that together. Sharing sharing Christ with others, to, to tell the good news and tell your excitement with other people because they really, they really need to hear it. And also in churches, there should be this discipleship where you're teaching and training other leaders to, to do what you're doing, to be leaders in the church, to be people who are able to follow God and, and really obey His commands in an amazing way. And so you should teach people that you should be able to teach others. And this is part of healthy churches. And another thing about sharing just the excitement of your new life in Christ, Jesus said that we're to be fishers of people. Uh, that we're, we're supposed to share that excitement. And, and part of that is there's different types of fishing. You know, you can go fishing with a fishing rod where you catch one fish at a time. And, and then you can do sort of large scale fishing where you have a big net. Part of church planting movements is you use all methods. You use personal evangelism, sort of one-on-one, -on -one, like a fishing rod, and then you do sort of large scales, as big as you can, that is sort of a little more non-personal, but uh, does speak to the heart. So number eight is abundant gospel sowing. Number nine, a building isn't the key to a successful, healthy church. Home groups can be. You can meet in houses. And importantly, this is often overlooked in areas where there's rapid expanding of the churches. And part of this is because you're not tied down by mortgages and you can use the money to be a blessing in the community and to help build the body of Christ. And so number nine, small groups and house churches. Another thing is that churches plant churches. And if you really build this into the DNA of the church, that they have a responsibility to share Christ with others and to lead and to form new churches, that this is a, a real key point to it, the rapid expansion of churches. If they believe that they should be giving of their time and their tithe, and if the church is involved with praying for opening up a new group, this is a key part to a real amazing expansion of the church. So number 10 is churches planting churches. Also, rapid reproduction. Uh, there's, there's one way of looking at things where a big African elephant is four meters tall, weighs 7,000 kilograms, and has a gestation period of almost two years. The calves that are born are 120 kilograms and take nine to 15 years to mature. And traditionally, church has been done this way. Big buildings, big budgets, big plans, and a long time frame. But if you look at rabbits, can produce 80 kilograms of rabbit each year. They breed every 90 days, and gestation only takes 30 days. So this is not big budget. You don't have to train leadership for years and years, but the local leaders can look after each other, and then that leader can look after the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And this is a real powerful way that a whole area may be impacted for the gospel. And it's much faster than the traditional approach. But you just have to keep that mindset that you're focused on not building big buildings and not having all these. And that's number 11, rapid reproduction. And another really important part is to incorporate new believers into the life and ministry of the church. In Colossians it says, For God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his Son, whom he loves. And this is like a, a transplantation. And just like plants, you have to do it fast or the plant will die. And all this work in the church, we can't do this alone. We need to include everybody, and we need to be intentional of starting the process early. There are people who want to help, but they don't know how to help or what to do. And so you have to invite them, you have to train them into this process. And, and once again, it's not like, hey, stupid baby, the food's in the fridge, the bathroom's downstairs, why can't you do anything? You can't just say, here's a Bible, church services on Sunday, and expect them to thrive as a new believer. But you have to incorporate them, you have to love them, you have to grow them up as the body of Christ. So, principle one, the authority of scripture. Two, passionate and fervent prayer. Three, intentional church planting. Four, local leadership. Five, bivocational or lay leadership. Six, local training of local church leadership. Seven, healthy churches. Eight, abundant gospel sowing. Nine, small groups or house churches. 10, churches planting churches. 11, rapid reproduction. And 12, a rapid incorporation of new believers into the life and ministry of a church. These are 12 of the key factors that have been found in church planting movements.